just before we get into the message today, I do want to uh, let you know that we have been challenged as a church uh, to participate in a 40-day prayer focus uh, leading up to the election on November the 5th. And so if you do the math, 40 days before the election is this Thursday. And so I'm calling you uh, to join us in praying over a 40-day period. 40 is a very significant number in the Bible. And uh, It'll be a time for us to, to repent and to, to call out on God. The, the scripture says this in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Notice our part is that we're to humble ourselves, to pray and to turn from wicked ways. And there's a lot of laws that are being passed around the country, both at state levels and national levels, that are just an offense against God. They're, they're completely opposite of biblical values, and we want to repent on behalf of our nation. You might say, well, I'm, I'm not having any wicked ways in my life. Well, then our nation does, and we don't want to offend God and have God's judgment poured out on us. We want to fall in alignment with him and his values, and so we're going to pray for God's will to be done. The scripture tells us to pray time and time again. It says, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions so that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That's what we want to do. We want to lead lead quiet and peaceful lives. And so we're going to pray. And so I want to challenge you to do that beginning of this Thursday, leading all the way up to the election. And we're going to pray and we're going to intercede for our country. So we're, our main text that's here today is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to read kind of a lengthy passage here. And then we're going to go back through it and we're going to kind of study it line by line. And I believe that God has something that he's going to speak to each of us today. The scripture says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Now this whole passage, both chapter eight and chapter nine in Second Corinthians are all about giving generosity and bringing offerings to God. And so he's using an analogy of seed and like a farmer would sow seed. He's saying that we can do that with the resources that God has entrusted to our care. He says, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God's able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which God through us will produce, thanks, will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only to supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. I know that was a lot. We're going to walk right back through it. I just wanted to give it all to you up front. We've entitled today's message, A Heart That Trusts God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word today, God, reverencing you and your powerful Holy Spirit working in our hearts and our lives, God, today we ask that you'd speak to us, God, that you help us to see your truth and walk in your truth. God, send your great anointing upon me to use my words to communicate your word very effectively. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to walk back through this passage, and I want to kind of bring four main ideas from it. The first one is found in verse 6. If we desire to be rewarded bountifully, we must give bountifully. Notice what he says here. He says, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, he's using an analogy from a farmer, and a farmer would take his seed, and if he sowed just a little bit, or sparingly, then he would not have a very large harvest, because he he didn't put that much seed in the ground. But if he planted a lot of seed, he's going to expect a lot of harvest, because he's put more into it. Now, I suppose that there might be some pain in putting that seed in the ground, because he no longer has it available to him to make flour, or do whatever he might want to with it, 
because now it's in the ground and now it's invested in the ground and now it got to wait for the harvest to come about. But Paul is saying that our giving is like we're investing our treasure into God's kingdom and we're expecting a harvest that's going to happen. There's a harvest that's going to happen materially. We're going to see that in a little bit. But there's also a spiritual harvest that's going to happen. There's things that God is going to do in and through me. He's going to do it in my heart. He's going to change my life because I'm going to reap everything good that God wants to get in my life. And so really what we want to do is we want to walk through where the scripture talks about this and just really kind of give you a lot of ammunition so that you can live the kind of life that's pleasing to God. In Philippians chapter four and verse 19, he has one of the most fantastic promises concerning our finances. He says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. My God will supply every need. I mean, that is a promise that you want to stand on to say, God's going to meet every one of my needs according to his riches. And he's talking about finances again in this passage here. But what we do is sometimes we take Bible passages out of context and we don't understand what is surrounding that and understand how we can make sure that that verse or that promise is something that we can apply to our lives. Uh, my pastor, when I was raised up in ministry, you know, he, he had this as, and he had a message that he preached on this passage and he called it the promise of 419. And 419, Philippians 419 became such a key verse for the church that when we would go to the Atlanta Braves game back at Turner Field before they built the new park that they're at, uh, they had a section 419 up at the very top, and when we'd go take all church trips to Turner Field to see the Braves, we would buy tickets in section 419 because we wanted to live in the promise that God's going to supply all of our needs. But what's the context that's here? The context is this right here, verse 15. So we're just backing up just a few verses. He says, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except for you only. He's saying that I went on the mission field, I left Macedonia, and when I left, you are the only group of people who said, Pastor Paul, can we make sure that we're sowing into your missions ministry? We want to make sure that all of your needs are provided for. He's saying you're the only ones who partnered with me in the giving and receiving. He says, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. So he's saying, I don't need the money that you have, but I want to make sure that if you want to put your seed into the ministry that I'm leading forward, I want to make sure that it's credited to your account. I want to make sure that you get the credit for it. He's saying, I'm concerned that you might miss out on a blessing that God has for you if you're not a partner with me in the gospel. So I wanted to let you know that I had a need. He says, I've received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable, and, a, and pleasing to God. So what he's saying is, you took up an offering, you sent it with your friend Epaphroditus, he came and brought it to me, and when I received these gifts that you gave to me, he says, it was a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So he's saying that there is a spiritual act that happens when we bring offerings to the Lord and God is blessed by them. They're a fragrant offering. That, that harkens back to the Old Testament when you would bring an offering to the altar of God when that offering was burned up, the smoke that would go up, God says it's a, it's a pleasing aroma to me. It's something that pleases me because I could see that you did it out of a heart to worship me. And then verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You know, it's connected. It's connected directly to the context of what's happening here. My God's going to supply your needs because you've put the needs of God's kingdom above your own. And now I know that God's going to take care of you. It's that promise that we can carry as we're partnering in the gospel together to believe that God is going to meet every single need. Listen, we support missionaries. We have over 60 missionaries and projects that we support on a monthly basis through our kingdom builders. People give regularly and we support them. And man, that money goes out of here and it's meeting the needs of people. And we believe it's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice that's acceptable and pleasing to God. And that we get to partner in that every week. Listen,
Listen, Jesus said that when you help people in need, it's like you're doing it unto him. Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Think about that. As you give, you're giving directly to Jesus. You're saying, Jesus, I want to meet the needs of the children that need to be fed. And so I'm going to give to them. And Jesus says, yes, that's a fragrant offering. That's a sacrifice that's acceptable to me. And we're bringing it to God. Did you know that you can't outgive God? You can't over sow. He says, sow bountifully and you're going to reap bountifully. Where where are we going to sow? How are we going to sow bountifully? We're going to give into his kingdom and watch his work go forth. In Matthew chapter 19, he says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, I will receive, they will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Think about that. Jesus says, you can't outgive me. I'm going to make sure that it returns back to you. I'm going to make sure that you're walking in lockstep with me, going everywhere that I tell you to go, doing everything that I tell you to do, saying everything that I tell you to say. We're giving into the kingdom of God and watching how God's going to multiply it. Here he says he's going to do it a hundredfold. I'm not giving you any promises that when you give, you're going to get. What I'm saying is you can expect Just like that farmer does when he puts that seed in the ground that something's about to grow. You can do the same thing when you sow seeds into the kingdom of God. Financially, you can expect things to grow. You're going to expect the ministry to go forward. You're going to expect more people to be reached. You're going to expect something to happen because we're sowing bountifully and we're going to reap bountifully because God's going to accomplish what he has sent his word to do. The second thing that I noticed from verse seven is that we must give with a right heart. Listen to what he says. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I want to walk through this about this right heart that we have here. The first thing I noticed is it's each one must give. This is a call for all of us. Some of us may not have a lot of resources, but God expects all of us to get involved in some way. Each one should give what he has decided in his heart. It's something that your heart has to decide. Your heart has to purpose that I want to be a part of this. I'm excited about it. I'm cheerfully giving this. This isn't something that somebody's manipulating me or coercing me. This is something I'm excited to do because I want to take the work of my hands and I want to worship my God with it. And I want to show my God that he has given me the way, the strength to earn this wealth. And now I'm going to return it back to him and say, God, I want to partner with you and be a part of every single thing that you want me to be a part of. But I want you to focus in on this, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a, a cheerful giver. What's he saying there? He's saying that there's a, a heart matter that we need to make sure that we're dealing with. And here's a question I want you to ask yourself. What is the quality of our heart's desires and motives. What's, what's the quality? What's the substance that's there? Because if it's not there, it's, it's not the kind of giving that God wants. God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't want you to feel like you have to. He wants people who want to. And man, there's, a, there's an unlocking of our heart from materialism that has to happen in order for that to take place. There really has to be an unshackling of our heart from being attached to the things of this world to say, you know what? I'm now going to purpose in my heart that I'm going to give towards God things because I want to make sure that I have a heart of complete dedication to him and his kingdom. Jesus gives us one of the greatest examples. He says this in Luke chapter 21, Jesus looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. Now we know that Jesus never tells a lie, but right here it says that she had two small copper coins and the other ones, they, they gave out of their abundance. So, so how could she have given more? Jesus isn't speaking of how much monetarily she gave. He's saying she had more heart 
in it. She had more of the right attitude in her giving. She wanted to give God her all. They just wanted to give God a little bit. To borrow from Pastor Maurice's words in that video, he said, I was bringing God a tip when God wanted me to bring a tithe. He, he understood that I needed to feel it. It was something that I wanted my heart to be involved in. That's why bringing a tithe or bringing 10% is such a great way to begin your generosity journey because it's something that you feel. It's enough that it's not going to break you, but it's enough that you feel that, that heart commitment behind it. It says, I want this to matter to God. I want this to be something that flows out of my heart. Listen, giving should be motivated by the purposes of our own heart. You should have a purpose or a decidedness in your heart to give towards something because it's your heart to give. It's your heart to support the things that the church is doing and how we're reaching our community. It's your heart to say, I want to make sure that this parking lot looks excellent because I want it to reflect the message of excellence that this church stands for. I don't want to have a dilapidated parking lot anymore. I'm purposing my heart that I want to be a part of it. And I want to commend you because this church is full of people with that kind of heart. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but we had a couple that got married here recently and they said, in lieu of wedding gifts, would you consider giving to our parking lot? I just thought that that was so amazing to have that kind of heart for the Lord and for his purposes. So what, what kind of purposes do you have in your heart to give towards the things of God? What kind of dreams and aspirations and goals do you have to say, I want to be able to give this much money to kingdom builders because I want to give missionaries the opportunity to preach the gospel in places where it's never gone before. Do you realize that we gathered here today because of the way that we give and we support missions, we are preaching the gospel in places in the world that people have never heard about Jesus before. Places like Indonesia right now, we have two couples that are in Indonesia that we support monthly, and we've done it for years. They've planted churches there. They've raved up missionaries from their local churches to go into tribes and indigenous areas to preach the gospel. We are partnered with them in doing that, and it's only because people get a heart for the purposes of God and says, I want to make sure that I'm a part of it. But what we do with our money really reveals what the true purposes of our heart really are. Let's just say I'm into quilting. And I spend all of the extra money that I have in buying more fabric, buying new sewing machines, having the latest, greatest scissors and other equipment that I need in order to just make rock star quilts. But then I don't give to the things of God what it does is it reveals where my true purposes really lie, where my true motivation is. Really, I'm all about quilting and I'm very little about the things of God because what Jesus said in Matthew chapter six, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says, your heart is very telling. I like to think of it this, money is a magnifier. It magnifies what's already there. Money doesn't do anything to me. Money is amoral. It doesn't have any morals to it. It reveals what's already in my heart. If I'm already stingy toward God, all money's gonna do is just show it. It's just to say, look, you don't care about the things of God because you're storing it up all for yourself. But Jesus says, where your treasure is, where your money goes, that's where your heart's gonna follow. If you wanna get closer to God, how about giving towards God's purposes and what he's established? I'll tell you what, your heart is gonna begin to go that direction and you're gonna find yourself more on fire for the Lord than you've ever been before. See, God doesn't want our giving to be grudgingly given, under compulsion, or, or somebody putting their arm behind your back and say, okay, well, this is what you got to do. No, God wants to be free. He actually uses this word here. He says, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, in the Greek, the, the word cheerful is hilaros, which is where we get our word hilarious from. It's actually stemmed right from this word right here. And so the idea is that we have such a joy in our giving. We have a cheerfulness, a joyous, and that we're prompt 
to do anything. It's something that we're excited to do. Man, Bianca and I, we love to bring the tithe to God. We do it digitally on our phone, and we love to do it. We do the little confirmation code, get, a, get text to your phone number and text the little code in like you got to do with everything nowadays. And we do that cheerfully. Why? Because it shows that God's blessed us. We have something more that we get to give and we get to honor God with. It brings joy to our hearts because we say, God, we want to honor you with it. God, we want to lift you up. God, we want to be about your purposes in every part of our lives. True giving comes from a happy, joyous heart. And God loves a cheerful giver. God loves when people give. And man, the reason why some of us haven't found joy in our giving is that we truly don't understand how generous God is. It's, it, we, we, we've missed it in our brains somehow and we think, okay, well, well I'm gonna have less. That farmer doesn't feel like he has less when he's put it in the ground. He feels like, oh, the more is coming. I've just got to wait around for it. What about the things that are most impactful to your life? What if those things could be satisfied through you getting in a partnership with God and your generous giving, and you could see that some of those things that you've been wanting to have happen, they're going to start happening, not because you're focused on that, but because you're focused on God and you're allowing God to take the rest of it. Your heart is literally just resting in how good and generous God really is. The third thing that I noticed from this passage is verse 8 through 11. The right kind of giving is always blessed. If you give out of a right heart, it's always a blessed place to be. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. There was a lot there. You notice how he kept using this word that just is so filled it's in every way. It's all sufficiency, all grace. Let's start with all grace. What's he saying? I want to make all grace abound to you. God's grace is his unmerited favor. It's his blessing and giving us what we do not deserve. So God's going to make all grace abound to you. So as you sow bountifully with the right heart, cheerfully, God's going to make his grace abound to you. And in his grace abounding to you, you're going to have all sufficiency. That's talking about your contentment, that you're not needing and grasping for things in life, but you're just saying, man, God has really taken care of me. Look at all that he has given to me to enjoy. Thank you, God, that all sufficiency at, in all things at all times, in everything all the time, you're going to have everything. And then he says, so that you may abound in every good work. You may abound in every good work. That you see a need and you're saying, I want to give to meet that need. Oh, that person's going through that. I want to be a part of blessing them. Because God wants me to be generous on all occasions. He says, as is it written, he's quoting from Psalms here. He distributed freely and he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He's not saying that our righteousness comes from giving. He's saying out of the righteousness that Christ has placed in our lives, we are now living that righteousness out by giving and meeting the needs of the poor and those who are in need. Verse 10, and he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Notice he's saying, as you give, God's going to multiply that back to you. Your seed is going to be growing and enlarging, and you're going to be ready to sow seeds on every occasion. He says, you will be enriched in every way. Notice every way. He's not just talking about materially. He's saying spiritually, you're going to be enriched. Physically, you're going to be enriched. Relationally, you're going to be enriched. Because what you're doing is you're becoming a generous person, and generous people are the best people to be around because they're always looking at how they can bless you. They're not looking at how they can take from you. You're going to become that kind of person when you begin these practices and you're going to be enlarged in every way, be generous in every way, which through us, Paul's saying, once again, I'm on the mission field. You're supporting me through us will produce thanksgiving to God. How's it going to produce thanksgiving? Because Paul's going to be preaching to people and they're going to get saved and it's going to be a great rejoicing because now more and more people are coming into the kingdom. It's so important for us to understand that when we give the right way, God's going to enrich us and bring us everything that we need to accomplish all the work that God has called us to. Because 
Money is like that, that seed that we put in God's ground, we put in God's kingdom, and it's going to produce a harvest. Listen to what he says in Isaiah chapter 55, or Matthew 10, 42, excuse me. And whoever gives to one of these, even a cup of cold water, because he's a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. What he's saying is that even the smallest amount that you give is something that God's going to bring a reward to you because you have given in his name and our giving, listen, our giving is rewarded in different ways, sometimes materially, sometimes spiritually, and oftentimes both, that we can expect that God is going to increase us in so many ways so that we are enriched in every way. So what the scripture says, we're enriched in every way so that we can see God accomplish his work. Remember, money's like a seed. In Isaiah 55, he says, for as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, Okay, so he says, this is what the seed is physically. Now he says, my word is like a seed. He says, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing which I sent it. What he's saying is, He's speaking these words out over us and we like good soil are receiving it and we're gonna accomplish his purposes. This message is gonna get in our hearts and we're gonna begin to give and get involved actively in what God's wanting to do and he's gonna use us to do it. It's gonna go out and it's gonna provide for so many people. See, our money is like a seed. If we give it according to the principles of grace, it will multiply to the glory of God and meet many needs. And that's what it does. That's what your giving does. It meets so many needs. They're all around us. And we're able to give generously to them. And we're able to see God accomplish his work in and through us. I believe that God enriches us so that we can continue to be more and more generous. It's not like he, he just says, well, I'm gonna enrich you to this point and then the rest of it's for you. No, he says, I wanna enrich you so you can get to a posture and a place where you're regularly giving. Randy Alcorn, the author of The Treasure Principle, he says, God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving in a place where I can impact those around me with the truth and that I can be a regular participant in God's activity in the earth today. God blesses us materially and spiritually so that we will have an abundance for every good work. We are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. Proverbs 22, nine says it like this. Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed for he shares his bread with the poor. A bountiful eye is a person who says, I can see how God's abundance can provide here. I can see how God's going to make a way for me here. I can see how God's enriched me right now for this very purpose in this very season so that I can give into his kingdom. And the fourth and the final thing that I want to bring to you today is our giving meets spiritual needs. Verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it's also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. It's overflowing, but it's for sure meeting the needs. Listen, your giving, your tithing here meets needs. There are children that are in this room right over here. They are learning the word of God today. It's planted in their hearts. When they grow up, they're going to know and walk with Jesus because you and I participated in giving and supporting the message of the gospel. There are children, teenagers that are meeting every Wednesday night with Pastor Antoine and Andrea. Their, their leaders there are pouring God's word into these teenagers at a pivotal time in their lives when they're choosing what they're really going to believe for themselves, which direction they're going to take with their lives. What are they going to do when they move out of mom and dad's house? And it's those moments that are so formative that you and I are giving into that. They're meeting actual needs that are taking place. There are small groups that meet at this building throughout the week and 
discipleship is happening. People are having real conversations about things that they've been struggling with, about marriage problems and issues, and they're receiving God's word as an answer, and they're building their lives on the rock of Jesus Christ, and it's because you and I are giving into the kingdom that we're making a difference. I could go on, and the list could go on about the missions work that we're a part of, and it's your giving that's making it possible. You are meeting actual spiritual needs that are happening, and God wants to grow us in that. In fact, there's one portion of scripture found in Ephesians chapter four, and Paul says it like this. He says, let the thief, the person who gets saved, he used to be a thief, let him no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So in the discipleship process, you used to be a thief, now you need to get to work, and now you need to not spend all that you earn, save a little bit back so that you can give it into God's work so that you could share with anybody who has a need because that's gonna be the fruit of a transformed life as a person that's beginning to get into this with God. And see, the world doesn't see things the way that we do. You know, we see things through this lens of faith. We understand that when we bring these offerings to God, God's gonna use them, but the world says when you give something away, it's gone. But, but, God's, but God says when you invest in my kingdom, it's going to produce a harvest and you will be enriched in every way. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 is one of, those, one of those verses that just doesn't make sense to the world. One gives freely and yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. What does this mean? It means when we give into God's kingdom, when we don't withhold from him, God's gonna make sure that we're blessed. But when we withhold what we should have been giving to God, we're gonna suffer want. And you might have the physical thing, but you don't have that spiritual component. You don't have that peace in your heart from just knowing, man, I'm a part of what God's doing. There's such a blessing that reigns in our lives when we're generous, freely giving people. I want to look back at that verse one more time, 2 Corinthians 9, 12. And I want you to look back at this because this is going to be an important point. He says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. He says it's the ministry of this service. And this, this word service is, is like what you would do if you were serving at the temple, if you were serving in God's kingdom. The, there's a ministry of service that happens. So, so you, you're worshiping God. Uh, listen, you need to turn your giving into worship. Turn your giving into worship. It's not just you giving money. This is you worshiping God. This is you honoring him. Listen, the Corinthian church, he says this in 1 Corinthians, or Hebrews, excuse me. He says, through him then, through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So when we worship, when we speak joyously and honestly with one another in truth, in love, Man, it's a sacrifice of lips and it's honoring to God. But not only that, he says, do not neglect the good, to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So our, our giving, this ministry of service that we have is blessing the Lord and now it's honoring to him and it's a spiritual part of our worship to God. Man, when we, Bianca and I give our tithe, when we bring our offerings to God, we do it digitally, like I said, and when we're doing that, man, we're praying and we're worshiping as we're doing it. We're saying, God, thank you. Thank you for bringing us this money. God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to give. We've done this ever since we got married. We, before we were married, we, we've tithed. My mom and dad taught me about tithing when I was a kid. They gave me 10 $1 bills, and they said, how much belongs to God? And I'd hold up one of the 10. This one goes to God. They said, well, make sure you give that in kids' church when you go to church today. And it was instilled in me from a young age. We've done the same thing with our kids. We've trained them up the exact same way. Everything. They get a gift from grandma. How much it belongs to God. We make them do the math. We make them count it out themselves. We make them bring it in an envelope themselves because we want them to get that joy of worshiping God through giving our offerings to him. This is exactly what Paul taught the Corinthian church to do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so to you are also to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, notice this phrase, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. This is Paul's teaching percentage giving. 
You know, it's not, it's not equal giving, it's equal sacrifice. Everybody in the church is doing an equal amount of sacrifice, and we're all bringing a tithe, or it's known as 10%. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But that's what he's saying. He says, as, as it's proportionate to their prospering, he says, as he prospers. So as God prospers, you set that aside. For, for me and Bianca, we do it digitally. We do it right when we receive it. If I receive a check in the mail, I open it up sign the check, put the account number on it, take a picture of it, upload it to my website, my bank's website, and then as soon as that goes ching, it makes a noise ching when it deposits in there, I immediately go to the church, open up, and begin to write out my tithe because I just prospered. I want to make sure that I'm bringing it to God. I want to make sure that I'm being faithful with it. I don't want to hold on to God's. I want to bring it to him as soon as I get an opportunity to because I want to worship him. I want to honor him. I want to say, God, thank you for bringing this into my life. It's part of worship. Paul says for them to do it on the first day of every week. Well, we gather here for worship on the first day of every week. I think it's a great time for us to bring that portion that we prospered this past week and say, God, I want to honor you with it. Now, you've heard me say this word tithe, and I want to break it down for you because it's, it's not a religious word. It's a mathematical word, okay? It means a tenth part or 10%. Leviticus 27.30, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's, and it's holy to the Lord. So way back in Genesis, Abraham was the first person to bring a tithe to God. He was the father of our faith. He's the father of the nation of Israel. It was born from his lineage. God made a covenant with Abraham, and Abraham began to tithe to the Lord. He began to give a tenth of everything to God, and God makes a part of the law and the Mosaic law, but tithing existed before the law. It's something that our hearts get to do because we want to say, I know where this came from. This came from you, God, and I want to honor you with it. I want to bring what belongs to you because I want to worship you just like the great men and women of the Bible have. And God has great promises that go along with tithing. He says this in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. It's amazing the promise that goes along with this tithe of thing. Anybody who reads this says, yep, I want that right there. What do I need to do? I need to bring a whole tithe? That sounds like the plan to me. That sounds like exactly what I want to do. I want to honor God with everything that he's brought into my life, and I want to bless him. This phrase right here, put me to the test, you're not going to find that anywhere else in the Bible. God, does, God actually specifically tells you, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But here, God says, I want you to test me in this. This area of bringing the tithe, of giving generously, I want you to put me to the test. In the King James Version, it says, prove the Lord here. Uh, back at the church that you know, Bianca and I grew up in uh, as, as young ministers, uh, the same church that did the 419 uh, we would do a, a day once a year. It was called Prove the Lord Day. It was based on this verse. And it was like, hey, if you haven't been tithing, let's, let's prove the Lord, okay? Everybody bring a tithe and let's test God in this and let's see him throw open the windows of heaven over our church, over our finances, over our families, over our lives. That's what we want to do. See, what Paul said to the church in Philippi, he says, not that I needed your gift, he says, I'm fully supplied. I'm, 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 I have everything I need. Listen, my God's going to supply all of my needs according to his riches. I want you to get the benefit. I want you to get the blessing. I want you to walk in his favor. I want you to experience all the good things that God has for you. I want it for our church. I want the windows of heaven to be open over our church. I don't want to have to talk about a parking lot for six months out of every year. I want to pave the parking lot because we've got more than enough because we've got everybody bringing a tithe. You realize when everybody brings the tithe, there are more than enough to meet every need that we have and then some. I have a vision that one day we're going to get to a point where off of the tithe, not off of extra giving, but just off of the tithe, we tithe from our church 10% to world missions, that we're giving 10% of everything that we receive. So last year, roughly $1.3 million was our budget. I want to see a day come when if we bring in 1.3 million, that we're giving $130,000 out of this church to missions. 
we're generous. We're doing a lot. We're giving a lot to missions. If you're a member, you get a member's report every year and see where all of our missions dollars are going. But we're not there yet. We're not, we're not there where I want to be. I want to get to that place. That's only going to happen when everybody says, yeah, I want to be a part of it. My pastor used to say it like this. He says, if you want to sit at the table and enjoy everything on the table, you want to pull your chair up to the table. He says, help put something on the table. Help, help make it happen. Help do it. Man, when everybody does a little bit, it's amazing what happens when everybody says, yes, I want to be a part of that. Tithing, it, it takes everything that we've been given and it says, God, we thank you for providing for us. I, I believe that when you begin bringing the Lord's tithe, you can watch how faithful God is to his word. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful every single time. He's never disappointed us. And I'm gonna watch him show up in so many of your lives. The goal for the message today is to get to this point. And this is a point where you get to just meet with God. Maybe you wanna grab the hand of your spouse. Maybe you wanna take this and, and take it home and pray over it and say, is this something that we wanna begin doing? Is we wanna begin bringing a 10th of everything that we have. We're not gonna, we bring it right off the top before we pay taxes and everything. I mean, we, we bring it off the whole thing because we're saying, hey, I can't outgive God. God's not gonna be like, man, you really could have kept a lot more of that money that you gave. He's gonna say, wow, look at their hearts. Their hearts are with me in my kingdom. Not, I'm not teaching you to do something that I've not been practicing for a long time. I've seen the blessing of it. My mom and dad did it. I saw the blessing that came over their lives. The great men and women of God that I've followed in footsteps of, they all practice tithing. I saw the blessing on their lives. I saw, man, they're blessed. And so I want to give you an opportunity to respond today. Our hosts are going to give a giving envelope to everybody in the room. And we're going to do a little exercise. Uh, you don't have to give anything today. I do want everybody to have an envelope there. If you did not receive a giving envelope, would you lift up your hand? Our hosts are going to come right now. They're going to give everybody one. And we're going to read the statement that's on the back. So just go ahead and put your hand up. I want everybody to have one. Uh, and we're going to just participate in this together. Some of you may want to put an offer in there. You can, but you don't have to. That's not what this is about. This is about our hearts before God. This is having a right attitude. So just put up your hands. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to, to grab a pen and to write either A, B, or C on the envelope. I'm not going to give you options D, E, and F because if you don't want to participate, just leave it blank. That's totally fine. It's totally, totally your, your, your decision. Not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful person. But an A means I'm already tithing. This is me just saying, hey, pastor, amen. Everything you said, amen. I'm with you. You, 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 we're here. B means I used to tithe. My mom and dad taught me how to do that. I knew I should have been doing that this whole time. I've not been there. Pastor, I'm recommitting to tithing today. I'm gonna begin again to tithe. We got some more over here. We got some more hands lifted up over here, right over here. And then C is I'm committing to tithe. Maybe you're here and you're saying, I'm gonna prove the Lord. I'm gonna test God. God said to bring the whole tithe. I've never done it and I'm gonna start doing it. I'm going to put a C on there. This week, our staff, we're going to pray for everybody, the A, Bs, and Cs. And you don't have to put your name on it. We're, this is anonymous. You can put your name on it if you're bringing, putting an offering in there and you want to just, hey, A, Jeremiah Bianca Stingo, bring an offering, you know, definitely you can put an A on there. But we're not trying to, to, to we're just giving you an opportunity to respond in faith to God. And we're going to put all these in the basket. And this week, our staffs, we're going to pray over all these, especially the Bs and Cs. Listen, especially the B's and C's, because that's the difference from where we're at to where God wants to get us, the B's and C's. The A's are already doing it, so the B's and C's are the ones that are saying, hey, we're with you now. We're, we're joining up with you. Our staff, we're gonna pray for you this week. We're gonna pray that God will prove himself to be faithful as you trust God by bringing the tithe. And many of you will even start next week. You're gonna say, hey, I'm gonna get some things in order this week in my finances, and I'm gonna start next week. But go ahead and do that right now. And as you're doing that, I just want to pray over this time of receiving this offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for your word that has gone out to touch our hearts and our lives. And Father, I pray, God, that you'd bless every person, especially those who are recommitting to tithing or making a brand new commitment to tithing today. God, it's a big step for so many people. God, I pray that you'd meet them there, that you'd show them your faithfulness, God, as they trust you and bring this to you. God, I pray that there would be a joy and a cheerfulness that comes over them as they give generously to you and your kingdom. God, that there would be a, a worship heart that's attached to it that says, man, 
I, God has been so good to me. I want to respond to him. God, bless this offering. Let it meet the needs of so many that need to hear your glorious message, your gospel, that good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross, rose from the dead so that we could be saved. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hosts are going to come right now, and they're going to pass a container through the row, and just drop your envelope in there. If it's blank, just drop it in there. If you put something in it, drop it in there. If you wrote a letter on there, drop it in there. I know there's going to be a lot of envelopes today, and that's okay. We want to give an opportunity for you to respond. As they're passing the containers, I do want to give an opportunity for those who may be here and have never given their lives to Christ. Maybe you're here today, and you're saying, I'm outside of a relationship with God, but I'm hearing this message today of God's love and his grace And I want to be a part of that. Listen, God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die. This is that God became a man. He was born into the world, just like every other human being comes, born through a woman, born into this world. God himself, as a baby raised up, lived for 30 years, began to do ministry for three years, and then he hung on a cross, died like a criminal, to pay for your sin, to pay for it in full, to where you could stand before God clean and not under God's judgment, but under God's grace and his peace. And you could have that in your lives today. In fact, I'd love for everybody to bow your heads with me just one more time. If you're here today and you're saying, Pastor, I need to get right with God. I need to pray and ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, to ask him to forgive me of my sin. I wanna be born again. If that's you here today, on the count of three, Just lift up your hand. One, two, three. All across this room, just say, I want to be saved today. Is there anybody? Yes. Anybody else? Yes. You can put your hands right back down. I see that hand. Yes. Let's all pray this prayer out loud after me to encourage those who may be praying this for the first time. Say, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died for my sin and you rose from the dead and defeated death. Jesus, I believe in you and I want you to save me. Make me born again so I can live for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, can we just celebrate God's grace in this place? Listen, if you just gave your life to Christ, make sure you tell somebody. You can tell somebody by coming forward and talking to one of our prayer team members. Or you can text the word Jesus to hear on the screen. Would you stand up with me? We're going to be dismissed. I'm going to say a blessing over you before we leave. I'm going to invite our prayer team to go ahead and make your way to the front right now. Our prayer team, you just line up across the front here. If you need prayer, if you're going through something, you need God to get involved in a situation in your life, make sure you come and have one of our prayer team members pray with you about it. Let me say God's blessing over you. Heavenly Father, would you bless your people? God, would you make your face shine upon them? God, would you give them your abundant peace? And God, would you be with them in all of their comings and goings throughout this week? And God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here. We love you. We'll see you next Sunday.